جميعا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد welcome everybody to our to center of excellence in information assurance at king saud university r&d lecture series so uh, this is part of our cybersecurity lecture series in uh, R&D field. And it is my pleasure and honor to actually introduce uh, Professor Jacob uh, Bayamonti uh, from the Skolokovo Institute of Science and Technology in uh, uh, Russian Federation. Uh, he is a professor in quantum computer science and technologies. He is also known for proving several uh, results in, the, uh, in quantum algorithms and also contributions in the mathematics of tensor uh, uh, networks uh, uh, and so on. Uh, he will be providing us with a distinguished talk uh, today. The talk will be um, uh, titled uh, 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 The Quantum, How Strange Physics is Actually Driving Technology Revolution in Cryptography and uh, Computing. Uh, without any further ado, uh, we will have Professor uh, uh, Jacob start his lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for your hospitality. It's been a great pleasure to visit so far, and I look forward to presenting this talk to you. And as was mentioned, um, and thank you for the introduction, the talk is about how this strange physics is driving a new technological revolution. And this technological revolution is in the area of cryptography and computing. And to begin with, I really want to thank my host for bringing me here, for setting this up. Um, you know, we, we arranged this during the uh, coronavirus period. It took us a long time um, to even be able to get here and to set up the course and the talk and everything. So thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure so far. Um, this, the trend in the number of patents per year in this technology really exploded from about 2017. Um, this plot is now old, but I tell you, it's, it's continued with this trend, and it's even accelerated a little bit. And um, around that time period, you had several facets kind of coming together. Um, you know, the, uh, these large-scale industrial projects started in the U.S. Um, to kind of take, um, to take what they did with the small scale, and they really started to scale it up. At the same time, in Europe, they started some projects. And then shortly thereafter, this Chinese project was even bigger than the rest somehow. So um, what we have today is a continuation from this trend. And um, we're just seeing this you know, kind of global rise of this quantum technology, which I think very few people are, are somehow aware of, of what is actually happening in this technology and what are the um, uses and benefits of it. And so as this is somewhat of a popular talk and as I am the sort of person that you know, enjoys to be somewhat philosophical, okay, because it helps us think deeply, you can ask yourself a difficult question. What is information, right? You know, what is knowledge? What is information? How are they different? These are very difficult questions to answer. And we can write down a definition of what this is, um, but is it actually a sufficient definition? So, People might say um, that a set of symbols, musical notes, words, icons, bits, mathematical equations, it all contains information. But that is the syntax of information. The semantics of information is how do you interpret that information, okay? More fundamentally, you would say that information must exist in the state of a physical embodiment. Abstract information, we would say, is something that you might be able to reason about. You might be able to reason about infinity. You could take the large number limit. But if that exists or not, physically, is the question that we want to, we want to consider today. So we want to consider information is something that must be represented in matter. And under that view, we say that information is governed by the laws of physics. And returning to our philosophical approach, perhaps being human, perhaps being human, somehow the thing that defines us is our ability to actually use information to describe ourselves. Okay, and I, I think that that's unique some unique feature of humans. 
Um, and it's a very important feature of humans. And so when did information and physics start to connect? You know, around the 1960s, these ideas started to really come together, where you had, um, you know, let's say the turn of the century, the 1800s until the 19th century, you had this idea that, um, you know, electricity was getting a little bit older. At that time, you had thermodynamics. You had steam engines and other engines. And there was this kind of crazy time in the history of science. And you had this idea of, of entropy, which no one really understands even today, not fully, and, and no one understood it then. And then around the 1960s, you have this idea of information theory. It started to become very popular, and I think it really became popular in the 80s and 90s, and it's maybe even more popular today. And so how does it connect to physics? What are the properties of information fundamentally? And you have Landauer's principle that says, if you are to erase information, you will increase the heat of your environment. This is uh, from the 1960s, and it's very interesting. And this was really, I think, the first and most profound early connection between information and physical sciences. And we would say that a computing device will dissipate heat in its non-information bearing degrees of freedom. What does that mean? You can construct a computing device that is reversible, but when you measure the state of that device, um, you know, eventually you can store that into memory, but when you erase that memory, it will dissipate heat. The devices that are our computers today, such as our cell phones, as miraculous as they are, they in fact dissipate a lot of heat. And there's a lot of degrees of freedom um, internal to those phones where there's bits of information that are just being lost to their environment. Okay, and some of the research going on today is to, you know, not just make a better battery, but to make a better phone. Where the processor of your phone, I think most people are quite reasonably satisfied with what it does, yet the battery life is something that is maybe less satisfactory. Okay, so that's a real life example of how this erasing of information, which is happening internal to your telephone, is dissipating heat. And so we talked before, we spoke before about the Industrial Revolution and the second law of thermodynamics, which was about this idea of entropy, which is increasing with disorder. And so, you know, you, you have your children clean their room, and then over time it becomes more and more messy. And that's kind of the idea. Or if you imagine we just take a snapshot in time right now and, and we freeze here, but the rest of this room ages for a thousand years the state of the room would become more and more chaotic. You know, it would fall to bits and pieces, and it would not resemble a state of matter that is uniform in its, as it is in its current setting. And we will say, and this is something that is in physics, that the second, you know, the, the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy and the disorder is something that always increases. Okay, so with time, it's always getting, you know, it's always increasing. And the energy in the universe available to do useful work is always decreasing. So as entropy goes up, the ability to extract work goes down. And you can think of this actually in terms of computer science. You say that a very, a very ordered um, memory storage device, you can extract a lot of information from this device. So for example, let's say that we have a book. You can extract information from that book, but over time, when that book is thousands of years old, it can become harder and harder and eventually impossible to extract useful information from that book because somehow the state of that book is decaying and the, as the entropy increases, the disorder of that book is increasing over time. And so a low energy or an ordered state of matter is a state of matter that you can extract information from. Well, I didn't, you know, um, you know, this happened before I think most of us were really doing any type of research, but I still find this story, although it's old, to be extremely fascinating and very motivational um, to think about in terms of computer science. And so for some time, and it even happens today, you'll see patents, okay? U.S. patents will be granted on perpetual motion machines, even today. People say, okay, why can't I build a device that somehow 
will run forever, okay? And, you know, one of the designs, one of the schematics that I think really captures this idea so beautifully well is this Perpetua Mobile diagram here, which I got off the internet, and I think it's very beautiful. And, the, and I believe that such a device, if it was constructed, it would indeed spin for some time. But eventually, this device would come to a stop if it wasn't driven, okay? And why is that? Why is that? And it took the intellect of Maxwell to put some type of paradox that was somehow equivalent to perpetual motion. And what Maxwell did is he said that there was a demon, okay, this little cartoon with the, uh, with the fork there, and this demon was able to control a box. Inside this box was a gas, okay? And so you can imagine this room is filled with molecules, and so it's a gas. And imagine that we had a divider down the middle, and every single time a molecule with higher energy would, would go in this direction, we'd let it pass, okay? And every single time there's a molecule with lower energy, we let it pass. So what we're doing is we're taking this room, we would reorder its state of matter such that one side of the room would be, let's say, much hotter than the other. And then we say this, this demon is lowering the entropy and creating an ability to extract work. And this was a paradox because this demon somehow is a perpetual motion machine. And it took 100 years for physicists and computer scientists, and actually it was a connection to computer science that eventually solved this problem. In 1960, Landerer said that the measuring process does not need to increase thermodynamic entropy as long as, there are thermo as, long as these pr processes are thermodynamically reversible. So in other words, he proposed this, you know, he, he initially proposed an idea that, measure, that removing information, erasing information, will necessarily dissipate heat. Then he came along and he started to study this Maxwell's demon and he said, look, this demon could be run by a reversible computer. And then Charles Bennett in 1982 said that every computer has to have a memory and eventually that memory will become filled. And then eventually that memory must be erased. And so you have no perpetual motion machine at all because this demon has finite memory. And he solved that problem in 1982. And he's working, he was working at IBM when he did that. He still is working there. And uh, Landerer was also working there. And so these were the early ideas that got the field started. And these days, we have the computers that we're ever so familiar with. The computers that exist in our daily life, they're built on transistors. It was not always the case, actually. So you'll find in the history of computing, there were many different computers, even supercomputers in the early stages. So for example, um, we'll talk a little bit about the computing industry in, the, in, the, uh, in Japan after the World War. Okay, there were supercomputers based on superconductivity at the time. And there's some interesting stories there. In fact, in the Soviet empire at the time, there was a huge um, analog computing industry where they would take and solve differential equations by mapping these differential equations to electrical circuits. In fact, this was also happening in, in uh, the United States and Canada as well. And the digital computer was an originally done with vacuum tubes, as we all know, and eventually the transistor. But once the transistor um, took shape, this kind of took over the modern world and computing, and these other technologies for many years were slowly removed bit by bit. Even probably this video camera, there's very few analog components left other than things that control the power supply. Um, most of it is just about converting an analog signal into a digital signal. Um, but it took a long time. Now you have this new idea um, in computers where based on, let's say, years and years of progress, we're able to control human beings, when I say we were able to control 
um, matter at a much smaller scale. So a transistor requires some quantum mechanics to understand it, but it's an averaging effect. You don't need to have the state of the individual electrons. Okay, you just have an average effect to create a transistor. So we say that this transistor would be described by the mean field theory. The new generation of technology, as we, we hope for, will enable us to control the individual electrons, the individual quantum degrees of freedom. In fact, it is a very interesting state of uh, the field because the, you know, the technology to develop a computer chip has been miniaturized so much that quantum effects are starting to actually be something that you must avoid in order for your transistor to function properly. And this reminds me, going back to the story about the Japanese computer engineer, Gato. He wrote down in his book, he said, you know, he's a very, very smart person. And he makes these supercomputers. Um, and I think many of you will know that the transistor, if you build it out of uh, low temperature electronics, the switching time is, is tremendously faster than a standard transistor. And he says, you know, here's a memory unit, um, which is now going to be called a flux qubit. Okay, it's the same design. And he said, you have to bias this strongly. Otherwise, quantum effects will make it random. Okay? Now, these days, we look back on that statement and we say, wow, he could have discovered this quantum bit, which we're about to speak about. And so these ideas, even though they were right in front of humans for many, many years, it took quite a bit to put them together. And so the new drive in computer science is not just about quantum computation, but it's about computers that are governed by physics, and the physics is made to embed algorithms. So for example, many of the algorithms that we're familiar with, such as simulated cooling, simulated annealing, metropolis-based algorithms, these were all originally inspired by physics. And so the idea now in computing is, can we build a physical system that allows us to do something that a traditional computer cannot. And in fact, one example of that might be the wind tunnel. There's still many different examples where a wind tunnel can outperform a computer simulation. So what are these new properties of information that we keep speaking about in such vague terms? How can we define them? So the quantum information era we will encode information into a physical system, and these systems would be governed by physics, in particular, perhaps quantum physics. And moreover, information and entropy, work and heat, et cetera, are fundamentally linked together, as information is physical, which we've already argued. And the laws of physics place the guidelines on what it is and is not possible when it comes to information processing and cryptography, for that matter. And so what happens at the small scale that would make a cryptographic researcher excited? It's a good question. Fundamentally, if you interact with a single quantum particle, you will change its state. This offers a type of protection, okay? This offers a type of protection. And in addition, fundamentally, if you have a quantum system, you cannot copy its state. This sounds very strange, but the early applications of this were actually for cryptography, not for computation. And one of the ideas that I would say is more familiar, okay, that is a little bit different than th these two ideas, the idea that is more familiar is that, you know, you read these popular articles about quantum computation, quantum information, and you say, okay, the register of my quantum processor can be in every possible state at the same time. But if you measure that state, you will measure it only in one of those states, which is interesting. It's, it's called the collapse of the quantum wave function. And so that is one of the properties that I would say is more common, but it overlooks, let's say, the more fundamental property of measurements perturbing a system, changing the state, and also that you cannot copy this information. The other quantum property is and this is a property that I like to describe. If you can imagine a ball, if I throw a ball on the floor and it bounces off the wall, right? Well, in the quantum world, even if the ball does not have enough energy to penetrate the wall, it will bounce back and tunnel through the wall. It's very peculiar. So you can, <laughs> you can kind of imagine, and, 
And these things have been studied experimentally. This is the most confirmed physical theory in the history of all physical theories. Um, the history of this theory of quantum mechanics, as I think many people will know if you read about popular science, it came together as a bunch of different pieces that you know, was only later was only later said, okay, this is quantum mechanics. And for, I would say, many years, I'd say the time that I studied quantum mechanics was just on the edge of when this quantum information theory was starting to begin. So I was taught this as some kind of strange way to do calculations, but probably even had some mathematical predictions that were non-physical. Then it took the quantum information people to say, look, this, can act this, this theory, these are not mathematical artifacts of this theory. These things are actually happening, and you can start to make experiments to predict them. And so now when you learn quantum mechanics, people are taught where these, these effects are actually happening. You can actually have tunneling. You can have the superposition. You cannot clone information. Um, but in the early days, even 100 years ago, you can listen to the, you know, you can read the readings of these masters that invented quantum mechanics, and all of them are essentially saying that we need to replace this with something that actually works because none of this can be true. It's too strange. And so the first real application of quantum information, okay, something that fundamentally was not governed by classical mechanics. I don't mean, you know, you need quantum mechanics. You need to understand basic quantum mechanics to predict a transistor. Yet if we never had quantum mechanics, we could come up with other equations that will somehow predict this, okay? And I, I don't know if the inventors of the transistor were masters at quantum mechanics. They had some idea of this. But you, could, you know, the logic of the transistor is not governed by quantum mechanics. Some properties of its function are. But people would not say that the logic of the transistor is quantum mechanical. BB84, named after Bennett and Brassad, 1984, when they published this, is a cryptographic protocol, which is the first one ever invented. There's been subsequent inventions that, are, you know, that solve or perfect different aspects of it. This was the first protocol that was ever invented to make a physically secure type of communication, a type of communication which is, you know, at least the communication part is secured by the laws of physics. You know, the classical pieces can still be hacked, okay? But this communication part, you know, sending these photons down the channel, this is secured by physics. And that's a, that was really a new idea in cryptography, okay? And an interesting story was that a young graduate student, you know, he graduated and he subsequently actually left science and went and, and you know, said, hey, I'm gonna go move to, the, move to the mountains and, you know, and have a goat farm and do this sort of thing, okay? He wrote this paper and he said, you can have a secure dollar bill Okay, you can have a secure dollar bill. This is the late 60s, where what we do is we write the code, the code of the dollar bill, some, in, some cryptographic code, some code number, in these quantum particles. And only the bank knows the code and something else. And I have to explain this to you just a little bit, and we will. For a quantum particle, unlike a traditional bit of information, we can measure a bit of information and we determine if that bit of information is in zero or one. We'll assign some values to zero or one. If we have a probabilistic bit, it's still the same thing, okay? We can measure the bit of information in zero or one, perhaps with some probability. A quantum bit has a peculiar feature. You're actually able to measure it in, let's say, two different ways. And in principle, the single quantum bit, once you measure it one time, you extract the useful information from it, but you can measure it in two different ways. And so we'll call one type of measurement a Z measurement. We'll call the other type of measurement an X measurement. And these two types of measurements, interestingly enough, if I were to prepare a bit in such that it what we'll say is in the Z basis, if I measure in the X basis, regardless of how I prepared it in the Z basis, it always appears to be a random bit, okay? So if I keep preparing this again and again and again, in the X basis, it appears to be zero and one with probability one half. Now, many of, many of you will know, if you study mathematics, theoretical computer science, or cryptography, um, good random numbers are actually hard to come by. 
So if you try to generate, actually it's true, you know, Mathematica is a very good program, I use this, but if you really try to generate some statistics on it, you can find that eventually there will be little flaws that are not actually following what you'd expect. There's little deviations in certain ways because their random numbers are actually, al although they're good, at some point they kind of break down. And so many people used this property of quantum mechanics to try to create random number generators. But this is not what we'll do today. And so the first idea by Weisner, it was never published. He submitted the paper and they said this is a crazy idea and rejected it, okay? And this can happen with new ideas. Um, this can also happen that, let's say, crazy people use the fact that this does happen to justify their crazy idea. So you never know if something's crazy or if it's actually gonna be a future good idea, I guess is the message. And so Bennett and Brassad created public key cryptography. Let us explain how this works. So for whatever reason, um, we'll have two parties for in BB84. We'll have the party which is Alice, has the ability to create qubits. So these quantum bits, um, and their ability to create them in two ways, in, and she will prepare a state of the qubit so that it is not random in either Z or is not random in X, but it is impossible for Alice to prepare a qubit that is deterministic in both X and Z. And Bob will be the receiver of the message and has the ability to measure qubits in two ways, called Z and X. So Alex, Alice will prepare, and every time she has a qubit, she says, okay, and you can think of it very simply, you know, if, if you have four, four points on a circle, you say this is the Z one, this is zero, this is one, and this will be plus and this will be minus, that's X. Very intuitive. So Alice essentially can prepare that and Bob can only measure one of them, and Alice can only prepare one of them. So either on this axis or on this axis. Then Alice will encode her information randomly in one of the two bases, Z and X. So Alice needs to generate a key, and then Alice needs to prepare that key into quantum bits. And the way that Alice will do that is Alice will select that key at random then Alice will select the Z's and X's at random, okay? And Alice would like to send that key to Bob. Now, it's interesting. If Bob knew the Z and X variable, so if Alice, Alice wants to embed the number zero and she picks X, so zero maps to plus, okay? So Alice will prepare the plus state. Now, the outside observer does not know that. So the outside observer can measure an X or a Z. If they measure an X, they got it right. They recover zero, but they don't know for sure because they could have just as easily measured a Z. So there's a probability of failure of actually one fourth. So for example, I can prepare one of the four states. They prepare, they select a basis. If they get the basis right, they're correct. And so Alice, in this example, will prepare 16 bits. This will be the code that Alice would like to deliver to Bob. And Alice will select randomly the following basis, X, Z, Z, X, Z, Z, X, et cetera, et cetera. Then, in fact, what Alice will do is we'll send a state where the state has four possibilities, okay? Zero, plus, minus, minus, plus, one, zero, all right? So the zeros and ones correspond to the Z basis. The plus and minus are zeros and one in the X basis. So that is the initial step of the sender. Generates a code, ran randomly selects a basis, prepares the state. Then the state has to be transferred. Okay, and this part is where, the, where you would assume there could be an eavesdropper, some villain that wants to take the state and extract the code. But first, Okay, and this kind of explains it again. So Bob, after all of these things, so Alice creates the bits, Alice creates the basis, she sends the state. Then Bob receives the qubits and measures each one on a random basis. Now, here's the first step that Bob receives. So, you know, you can just imagine you open your door, somebody gives you a box and says, here are your qubits. So what do you have to do? You have to extract information. What do you do? You pick either Z or X and you measure it. 
Okay? If you pick wrong, you flip a coin because it's random. But if you pick correctly, you get the right answer. Okay? How are you going to know if you got the right answer? That is really the, the beautiful question. So Bob recovers, for example, the following sequence. Okay? So Bob picks this basis here. And then you, know, you can simulate this using quarters. We played this game, actually, in our, in our training camp. And you you know, Bob extracts this sequence. All right? Bob extracts this sequence. So Bob keeps this sequence. Bob keeps this sequence. But what does Bob do? What does Bob do? This is, this is the next step. Alice and Bob compare their measurement bases, not the results, via public channel. So Alice says, here's my basis, the XZ string. Bob says, here's my basis, the XZ string. They look when they agree. They say, OK, these bits should agree. And when they don't agree, they toss it in the trash. That's OK. So it has to be replicated a few times. And you'll notice in this case, this is where their basis agreed. So we generated these randomly on Mathematica. So it's a very good random number generator for small systems. And you got 7 out of 16. That's about average, because you have about a 50% probability of picking the right basis. So that's kind of normal. And these bits will be, share, will be the shared key they use for encryption. You can obviously scale this up quite a bit. You could send thousands of bits. You could also put RSA or another protocol on top of it to embed more security into this. But fundamentally, this is based on the following ingredient, which we will soon describe. If I measure a bit, I change its state. So you cannot measure a quantum bit without changing its state. And I also cannot copy it. Okay, so the question is very simple. I'm trying to send these bits to you, or you're trying to send these bits to me. What if, what if someone gets those bits? What if they take them and they try to extract the key? That's what we'll talk about a little bit now. And we'll call this, the eavesdropper will be called Eve for some reason. And this eavesdropper wants to spy on Alice and Bob. So somehow she, interrupt, she in intercepts the bit stream. Okay, so for example, we're sending this through a fiber optic cable. They put it some kind of, you know, splice into this, and they somehow try to extract this information. This is probably really the best way to hack a classical signal, correct? Just get a hold of the signal if you can, or catch it through the airways, right? And so Eve, here's the trick. Eve does not know what basis to measure in. So Eve would have to measure Z and X randomly, and 50% of the time, she'll be wrong. Okay, therefore, Bob measures in the correct basis, there's 50% that Eve would have changed the basis of that bit. And so 25% of the time, if these bits are accept, uh, intercepted, the final result will not match. Okay, and so what you can do is the following. I will send you 1,000 bits. On average, we'll agree half the time. Out of those half, let's publicly put up the first, let's, let's publicly put every third bit or whatever, some random number of bits. Okay, I, I pick I pick a hundred. We put them on the internet, and you know if it, if it looks like there's a huge number of them that are kind of not matching, you know, then we detect an eavesdropper. So all it has to take is one party has to put that on the internet. So for example, Alice can say, okay, I came up with a with a classical algorithm that randomly generates assignments of a hundred bits. I put bit number three, bit number thirty nine, bit number forty two. I put these all on the internet, and then on your side, you can detect if there's an eavesdropper or not. In fact, people might complain, yes, they'll say it's probabilistic, right? But somehow it's still provably secure. There was proofs to say this is actually secure, this actually will work. There's a lot of people that spend their lives, okay, trying to hack these devices. The attacks are on the classical side. You know, you can look for certain even vibrations of the machine. Right? It might vibrate slightly differently when it prepares a zero or a one. So they really thought of everything. Okay? And so they, they believe that this is a very secure method. Nonetheless, there's even better methods today that um, will actually use what's called entanglement to distribute the key. And it will remove some of the probabilistic aspects. And you don't have to know the key ahead of time, but you'll actually use two quantum particles that will somehow be interlinked to randomly decide the key. Nonetheless, 
for conceptual purposes, this is the most beautiful protocol because it's, I mean, it's just very beautiful. You know, VB84, I think it's very beautiful. And so to kind of summarize what's happening, let's say we have Alice and we have Bob and we have an eavesdropper, Eve. It is true that Eve can pick the correct basis, right? So you'll see on the third line here, you know, Alice prepares this state, maybe this is a plus state, and Eve measures in the plus minus basis, and therefore, Bob, everyone gets the good value. Eve receives information. But with a probability of one fourth, Eve will receive the wrong information, and you will detect it. Sorry, with a probability of one half, Eve will receive the wrong information, and you will detect it one fourth of the time. In a world with perfect transmission, all Alice and Bob have to do is publicly compare a few bits to determine if there are any errors, right? Um, you'll notice that you know um, these these errors are very easy to calculate because they're just quarter tosses, basically coin tosses. So you have something that always scales with one over two to the m. Um, errors exist in reality, but 25% error does not exist in reality. If it did, the, the device would obviously not work very well. So you have to make sure that your physical device has a low error rate that's far below 25%, and you have to pick a number of bits to compare, which is far above the threshold of the error of the device. This can be done for people that study statistics using concentration inequalities, Hoffington's inequality, where it says, what's the probability of your sample size to deviate somehow past the mean? So this has all been worked out for many years, and it does work, and in fact, there's MagicQ, ID Quantic, et cetera. There's many commercial companies that distribute this. And um, you know, this in here is some kind of fiber optic cable between two sides. And <clears throat> you know, it's commercially available. It's quite easy to look this up. And it's being um, deployed across the world now in different things. You know, banks, um, banks that are, let's say, next door to each other are using this now. They have communication. They just simply don't want their information to be hacked. And kind of the current state of the art, um, you've all heard about these famous experiments from China where they, they have, you know, they implemented BB84 and also what's called Eckert, um, the Eckert protocol, and they did this with a satellite link. Okay, so they, you know, they, they use this satellite to distribute this key. So it's very beautiful, very beautiful. And this is uh, 1,200 kilometers. And we'll switch gears a little bit because we know, we know that cryptography is not just about a secure transmission of a signal, but also about the secure storage of information, right? So I might not need to send, I, I might not need to send my information. I might just want to put it somewhere into some data bank and secure it. How is this done, okay? A lot of people will use zip, right? So you say, okay, set your password, and WinZip or something will compress that information. But how secure is that information really? We know from our own lives and from Moore's Law that something like every two years, you know, you get a new iPhone that's twice as, you know, it's much more powerful, it's twice as powerful. Maybe it feels like it's slowing down though, doesn't it? Like I, I didn't buy a new phone for like five or six years because I feel like it does everything I want. But it used to be, you know, if you, if you remember back 20 years ago, you're like, I wish, I wish the pen on my tablet worked a little bit better. I wish this worked a little bit better. And somehow human beings, I think, are somehow becoming more satisfied with technology in fact, many people say that the idea that the number of transistors will double on a chip every 18 months is coming to some type of an end technologically because the feature size is becoming too small because you're actually ending up with these quantum effects and it can't actually work anymore. But there's always these new innovative tricks from computer engineers um, that seem to still double the processing power. Um, and as we know, one of the most important things for numerical computational physics, okay, and also biology, biological science, mathematical biology, was the uh, gaming industry, the GPU. I remember 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, you'd go over, you know, in, in Harvard, you go in there, there's a bunch of PlayStations, okay, in these guys' office, they wire together 50 PlayStations, right? You don't see that anymore. Now it's just a GPU farm, okay? One of the, one of the most, one of the saddest things actually to talk about that you know, it's like a Bitcoin. Although philosophically, maybe you agree or don't agree with the concept, but to assign a dollar value on something that literally has no value, 
and then to solve this massive computational problem, it seems almost like against the ideas of humanity, right? I wish, you know, there's some of these other cryptocurrency where you have to crack like a medical problem, right? You have to find a new, a new drug or something, like discover something for human beings. Okay, so anyway, we want to encrypt. How do we encrypt? How do we encrypt? And I, I think most people watching this, I, I think you know more about cryptography than myself. Okay, I study a different type of computer science. But I know something, and the typical way to encrypt is to create a computational problem that has an easy answer, but the answer is hard to find. That's the typical way to encrypt. Factorization, okay, is behind RSA, but you can do other things. You can do other ones. You, you know, there's other types of cryptography. And what is the idea behind this, and why would quantum mechanics help? And I think it's maybe not so suitable for everyone in this room, yet nonetheless, I find this example to be quite good. So Euler, in the, seven, in the 1700s, he moved to Kaliningrad, okay, and he started a mathematics school there. He was a very unfortunate guy. Despite being quite good with mathematics, he was actually not a very smart person. His students appeared in the middle of one of his classes and said, hey, we finally finished this telescope that we built for you. So he walked outside and took a look at the sun and blinded himself. That caused an infection which made him go blind in the other eye, narrowly, yet he still did his mathematics. Nonetheless, it's a very unfortunate story and he was very influential for the, you know, the Kaliningrad school. And the problem that he solved was actually related to the town he moved to. Okay, these Russian guys had this game, they said, okay, can you cross every bridge one time and you know, have a beer on each, this is what these Russian guys do, okay, I don't, I don't drink myself, but this is, they like to do this, right? You know, they, they wanna cross the bridge every time and only cross it one time and they wanna visit every pub in the city, all right? So we could, we could say, okay, you wanna have a coffee at every, at every time if you don't drink, okay, it's fine. But the problem goes like this. So you imagine, it's a difficult problem. You, you, maybe you learned how to read and write but you never learn mathematics past, and even the symbol system that we have today, this beautiful language of mathematics, okay? Part of it came from this region here, okay? Algebra and all of this. The symbols, the symbolic manipulation of mathematics at that time was even different. It wasn't as advanced. So they, you know, you didn't have these tools. You were not educated with these tools. And so these people in this town, they had this problem and it was like folklore, like a legend. Can you cross all the bridges, yet only cross them once? And start where you stop. Stop where you start, okay? And so Euler, he said, look, this is too difficult for me to think about. So he drew a graph. And he invented graph theory. In some sense, he, you know, graph theory is kind of the start of computer science, right, in some sense, in some way. And he said, you know, you can't do this. And the reason why is because of properties of this graph, okay? So that's an interesting question. That's kind of, I'd say, one of, the first, one of the first questions where you abstract a problem away and you put it into some, some type of another term. Now another problem, okay, which is similar. Now this problem, when you have a no instance, as we know, no instances in computer science are hard. They're difficult because how do you prove no? Right, so I, I keep this example because how do you prove no? It's kind of interesting. Yes is easy. If there, if there was a way to do it, Euler would say, one, two, three, four, five, seven. That's your steps. But no is hard. No is hard. No is hard for computer science. No is hard for mathematics. Okay, so this is a no instance. Now, here's another question. And we all remember back from our days of algebra, you know, you're like 10 years old, 12 years old, and you really just hate this quadratic formula. Okay, but maybe not as much as geometric proofs, but it's like, okay, you know, you learn this quadratic formula, but it just never goes away, all right? So you have to factor. And you realize that factoring, even for this simple thing, is hard. Right, so factoring is always hard. It's, it's something that frustrates school children around the world. And in fact, factoring doesn't get any easier um, if you look at big numbers. And so the game that RSA plays, as everyone knows, is you're given this integer, and you're promised that this integer is a product of two prime numbers. And your goal is very simple. You just have to find the prime numbers, OK? And this is a very easy problem to state, and it's an easy problem to verify. And so that's the beautiful thing. This problem has a very easy answer, a very easy answer. And it's promised to always have such an easy answer because you're able to construct it. Where with the Euler problem, 
if I look at graphs that have what's called a complete cycle, it's actually difficult to generate those. You have to be careful about that. You have to look at, you know, you have to look at the graph. It has to be a symmetric graph. So this is easy to generate, and this is easy to check. So it's a very good problem. And there's a third property. It appears to be very difficult to solve for any computer. In fact, although it's easy to check, it's in the complexity class NP. It's a checkable in polynomial time. Yet, it appears to take super polynomial resources to solve it, OK? In fact, exponential, right? And so we use this feature to make RSA encryption. We use this to make encryption. And so that is the idea. And the, the problem with the quantum computer, OK, the problem that it poses for classical cryptography is everyone says, well, hey, I'm using, you know, maybe some combinatorial problem, maybe some elliptic curve cryptography, maybe RSA. And apparently, this quantum computer is going to be able to solve these, these problems a bit faster, right? And maybe even quite a bit faster. And so in the early days of quantum computation, a lot of the investors into this field was actually from the banking industry. They're like, look, even if this is 50 years away, we're quite interested. Is this really going to work? And so you know, these, these guys actually researched this quite a bit after the discovery of Shor's quantum factoring algorithm. And so <laughs> the type of questions that we will try to answer in this domain is, how fast can we solve a given problem? What resources does this require? And does physics allow us to solve problems using polynomial resources, polynomial in the size of the problem? So classical computers, although we don't have, you know, it, it's one of these things where, again, you know, proving something doesn't exist is always harder than showing it does, right, typically. So is there a better algorithm for factoring? Well, probably not, but you don't have a proof for it. However, you do have the existence, if we had a quantum computer, we could run the Shor's algorithm, and it would factor. It still would take a million qubits, okay? But in principle, it would factor RSA, it would crack RSA. How far away are we from that? We are far from that. So there's nothing to worry about there. OK, at least not now. We're, you know, we're, we're minimum you know, five to 10 years from something like that. Now, interestingly enough, there's other ways to factor on a quantum computer besides Shor's algorithm. Um, still, to have those get to RSA, that's a very high bar to cross. I think, I think RSA can be cracked with classical computers, but what would it take? It would take so much. You know, this is, for, the, for that much energy, you could get so many bitcoins, right? You would, you'd never want to do this. And so here we are today, and quantum physics does change something. And the limitations and the best known applications, in fact, um, they're not all in cryptography right now on the computational side. So you sort of have two industries. You have this cryptography industry on this side, and you have the computer chip industry on the other side. The cryptography industry is trying to make a secure channel, um, yet that doesn't solve the memory problem. The computing industry on the other side is a little bit young to address the memory problem because it's not able to solve problems at the level of the encryption. Okay, So that's where we are in, the, in terms of cryptography um, because I think that's the main interest and the main message I, I kind of deliver. So, there is a way to do the communication today. But the memory storage is not currently vulnerable from a quantum attack. Nonetheless, um, I believe that most experts in quantum technology would say that, in all honesty, the, you know, the future eventually, you know, I've had many different people talk to me about many different things. And I've always tried to be as honest as possible. And I remember this very famous oil and gas company comes to me when I first came to Russia. He said, hey, I want to take you to lunch because I want to do a quantum computing project. And I spent the entire time telling him what a bad idea this was. And at the end of it, he says, you're not going to convince me not to do it. Right? We're going to do it anyway. And then I had another guy said, what is your current solution? There's some kids in a basement with a laptop. So you want to go from a kids in a basement to a laptop to a quantum computer. So you have the cheapest solution in the world to the most expensive. And he, you know, and, and he comes back to me. You know what he said? Well, I want to go quantum now. I don't want to upgrade later. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. So, you know, this was early, this was like 2017 time period. Since then, the field has changed quite rapidly, and the current state of the art is, I'd say, much more promising. And both of these gentlemen now have a different view, 
but both of them have done some projects. And in terms of the oil and gas company, they concluded, look, it's a 20-year transition to adopt a new technology. You start off small, and you slowly learn about this technology, what it can and cannot do, and you have people learning and training on this. But in the 20-year period, that technology becomes different, but it becomes adopted. And they kind of look at it that way. And I think that that's sort of, let's say it kind of like this. So the first applications that we will see with quantum technology will be, let's say, for medical science. But the very first ones will probably be only for um, toy problems, for physicists. you know. And then it'll become a very expensive solution for a long time, even when it does start to do something. And then it can become every day where these computers just become something that you can use. At that point, um, there probably will be a way to, like, let's say, factor large numbers, maybe not with Shor's algorithm. Um, and so now we're still in the early stages where people are becoming curious from the different communities. They're learning from the different communities. But there's currently, I'd say, no threat to RSA. If there was, I think the world would be a much different place. You'd see a lot more panic, obviously. Now, this is, again, old, but it still gives a, a relative idea of the size of investment. I think the only change on this right now is that China is trying to you know, outperform everybody else on quantum. And they're very serious about it. So the, the governments, um, you know, uh, in the US system, in the United States system, when you, when you have research R&D investment, you get a tax break, okay? So you can either throw your money into the bin or save a pink dolphin, right? Now there's some angry pink dolphin because the money's going to quantum. So Google, Microsoft, IBM, you know, many of these early research results were funded, and they used to fund a lot more, let's say, mathematics. Now they're focusing quite a bit on quantum because it has so many different elements of information processing. And so you're looking now um, at, a, at a situation where the, you know, the leading companies in the world are now investing heavily in this, and they, they sort of don't care if it's immediately successful. They're not going to come back and judge this as a bad investment because they just consider this sort of the, R and the research and development leg. What they found, what did they get out of this? Okay, what I've noticed is many people that get their PhDs normally would go and try to do a postdoc. Now they get paid twice as much to go to a startup and they'll never come back. So you ended up with these sort of, you know, another generation of physicists that are kind of lost to computer science. Uh, the banking industry at the start of it, you know, finance, financial prediction and everything, they took a lot of physicists the same way. It's good, it's good for things. It's not a bad thing. So that's one thing. You get a lot of transferable skills. Um, there's other things. So using ideas from quantum and techniques from quantum, they're pushing several different things much further. One is actually refrigeration, as strange as that sounds. You have to make your quantum computer cold, so you have teams of 100 engineers working on a refrigerator, which really hasn't happened for 50 or 100 years until the, since the beginning of refrigeration. So they're thinking, thinking, thinking. And there's ideas that are coming out of this. The other one that is interesting is signal processing. Um, these processors require some of the world's best filters. You can't just go onto, you know, whatever, whatever's the electronic company now. It, it used to be Radio Shack when I was a kid. You can't say, OK, I'd like this filter with this property, and I'll adjust it. No, 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 you have to build your own filter. You have to say, I want an inductor here, and I want this crazy circuit. And you have to have the world's best filter engineer looking at that schematic every day with a team of 10 engineers, everyone with a PhD, trying to figure that filter out. Okay, one of these guys is John Martinez, who used to work at Google. And so there's many, let's say, sub-industries that are also slowly changing technology or even, um, even creating new technologies that are coming out of this. So the investments seem largely, I would say, stable, with the exception of the stuff on the stock market. You know, everybody asked me, they said, which, um, which quantum company would you like to invest in? And I said, I don't know which one I'd, I'd short first, okay? And I was having them explain to me how to short one of them, okay? I'm still not sure I understand it. <sighs> All right, so that is my talk. I think, I think it was about 45 minutes, and I'd be happy to discuss further. I think people have questions. If I can't answer the question, I'll write it down. And if you have a question, I can get the information to you as well, because I don't know the answer to every question. But so for example, if you ask me a question, I say, oh, you know, this person over here might know the question, the answer better to me, or this resource over here, this book has that information. I can hopefully find that, and if I can't find it now, I'll, I'll write it down. And so that's, that's the end of the presentation. I hope that that was what you uh, hope to see. I, I enjoyed presenting it. Thank you.